Today we are going to be talking about, uh, again, one of the greatest figures of Western classical political philosophy, in fact of all philosophy. Uh, we are going to be talking about Aristotle. In Arabic he is known as Arastu. And in Urdu obviously he is also known as Arastu. We are going to be briefly looking at his biography, then we are going to look at his understanding of logic and theory of uh, knowledge. We are going to be looking at his principles of ethics, which is the golden mean. And last but certainly not least, we are going to be looking at his work on politics. It is very important for you to understand that when I do these lectures, they are broader lectures. They are not meant only to explain the text, but they are meant to lay the context in which the text can be understood. That doesn't mean that uh, you should, that uh, means that in fact, uh, not only should you come and attend my lectures and so on, you should not expect that the lectures will merely be a regurgitation of what is in the text. You have to read the text on your own separately and understand it. Your examinations are primarily going to be out of the text, not out of my lectures. But my lectures help the foundation give you the context in which the particular text can be understood, the reading can be understood. So these are two separate things. Please try and understand that and uh, try and work according to that. Now Alexander was born in 384 BC. He probably died in 322 BC. He belonged to Greece. Again, he, worked, uh, he wrote about 31 works and he also created an academy except he called it a lyceum. Now, if you know, uh, you know, you must have heard the, the, uh, the, the phrase or you must have heard of the school Lahore Lyceum. Well, Lahore Lyceum is basically paying homage to Aristotle and anybody that calls themselves an academy is in a certain sense paying homage to Plato, even if they don't know it. Aristotle and Plato's relationship is the key relationship that builds the debate in Western philosophy. Aristotle was a student of Plato. He joined Plato's academy at the age of 17 and he studied under Plato for 20 years. In fact, despite his disagreements, he only left Plato when the latter passed away. But he did challenge Plato. Some would say he turned Plato on his head in the sense that he turned Plato's philosophy the other way around. And the debate between master and pupil is the greatest debate in the entire history of philosophy. Here you see the famous, uh, just one part of a famous painting. The painting is called the School of Athens, which is in the Vatican. In the, uh, uh, in, in the Vatican. And in red you see Plato, who is pointing upwards. And in blue you see Aristotle, who is pointing downwards towards the earth. And that, is, that symbolizes the great debate between idealism, which is the view that there are ideal forms that are at the heart of all the material objects that you see, and materialism, which is looking at, the, at matter, at the earth, which is saying that matter is at the heart of all the ideal forms that you see. Uh, it is rumored that Plato once remarked that Aristotle has kicked me as a colt kicks its mother, ek bacha jaise apni maa ko thoda mare, isi tarah Aristotle ne mujhe bhi thoda mara. But Aristotle replies, Plato is dear to me, I love him, but dearer still is the truth. I cannot let that go. What an amazing intellectual relationship that it is. Yes, Aristotle was the teacher of, of Alexander. After Alexander's death, Aristotle feared for his safety and left Athens, he went into self-imposed exile. Had he not done so, the anti-Alexandrian party would probably have put him on trial. So, so, Plato, uh, so uh, Aristotle remarked, I see no reason to permit Athens to sin twice against philosophy. The first sin of Athens against philosophy, of course, is the trial and execution of Socrates. So he left. But this was at the end of his life when he had more or less done all the most influential work for which he is known today. Aristotle can also be credited as the first 
genuine scientist in history. Every scientist that has ever come in all human history owes a major debt to Aristotle. So says the Encyclopedia Britannica. In other words, Aristotle is not merely, you could, you could say that he is a philosopher, certainly that is true, but he takes philosophy and then he tries to understand botany, biology, logic, music, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, cosmology, physics, the history of philosophy, metaphysics, psychology, ethics, theology, rhetoric, political history, government and political theory, rhetoric and the arts. He is regarded as the most influential philosopher of all time. Um, you can see that he is of an encyclopedic mind who once he creates a certain method in philosophy then applies it to every branch of knowledge that was available at the time and in every branch he, he breaks new ground. He makes new discoveries that were not known to people then. He is phenomenal in this regard that uh, for a person for a single individual to make so many groundbreaking discoveries in so many different fields is absolutely remarkable. How did he do it, you may ask? Well, the key lies in his method of study. I like to say his method of madness. What was his method? Once he had devised a clear-cut way to study things, he applied that method to all the different things that were, uh, all the different questions that he was curious about and in every single question, as diverse as metaphysics and physics, he was able to get, he was able to break new ground, he was able to make new discoveries. The key is in Aristotle's method. His understanding, his study of logical reasoning, Aristotle is considered therefore the first great systematizer and classifier of knowledge. He is the inventor of all the major terms that we use today. Uh, all the most of the major terms that we use in social science in philosophy and even in science were created by Aristotle so how does he do it uh, well first of all he likes to start with what we call a literature review and if you write a social science essay today you will notice that you will also tend to structure your social science essay in the same way as Aristotle structured his essays 2,400 years ago. Such is his incredible uh, contribution to mankind. The first thing that we do is create, he used to create an index, an index, in other words, a literature review. What have people written on the subject? I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel. The first thing I have to do is read what everybody else has written on the subject and read what the most important people have said on the subject. Then from that index, he tries to discern the two major camps that exist on that particular question. Whatever that question is, physics, chemistry, whatever the question is, usme jo major debate hai, wo hai kya? For example, what is the major debate, the major debate in um, theoretical physics today? Anyone? Nobody knows? Yes? I don't know the major debate, but the key concepts that are, I mean, in fashion, in Theoretical physics are the string theory, black holes. So mm -hmm. these are the issues that are most like they're trying to. Mm -hmm. Some scientists are trying to disprove string theory. Some are trying to conclusively prove it. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that are going on. Yes, exactly. That's 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 a good response. Um, the great debate is between quantum mechanics um, and the theory, general theory of relativity. Uh, that is the fundamental big debate in in um, in physics today. So in the same way. Uh, what are the big debates in philosophy? What are the big debates in metaphysics? What are the big debates in epistemology? That's where he begins. If you are, for example, writing a paper, and you're writing a paper, let's say, on gender, study, on gender in Pakistan, the first thing you want to understand is, what have people written about that? And what are the major lines of demarcation? What is the big debate in that particular field? That's the first thing you want to understand. And then, of course, you want to apply your theory of epistemology and logic and you want to uh, try and discern things from that. So here are some key figures, Aristotle, Ibn Hashim, and Galileo Galilei in the history of the development of science. Here are some of Aristotle's great books uh, that he wrote to, uh, to, for us to develop the tools to, for critical good thinking. Categories on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics. So, so 
one thing that Aristotle likes to do is, is, is he likes to take a big problem and then he likes to break it down into smaller problems. He likes to classify things. For example, he divides science into three categories. Into the theoretical sciences, that those are the natural sciences, like for example, physics, chemistry, biology, zoology, and so on. These are natu natural sciences. He calls them theoretical sciences because he feels they have no practical real uh, uh, value. They can't really be practically utilized. Now you might say that's absurd. Uh, physics, chemistry, etc. have enormous practical value. But you have to go back to the time of Aristotle where, um, where discoveries about physics didn't really change fundamentally, or chemistry or biology didn't really fundamentally change the way that production was undertaken. Most production was undertaken by the hand, productive techniques were very, very primitive, and so on. And most of the debates in physics were far too, were, 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 were of the kind that had no impact on economic production whatsoever. Hence, um, Aristotle thinks that they are, these are theoretical concerns, they have no practical value. But these are theoretical concerns. Today, of course, we think of physics, chemistry, math as in the very opposite way. We think these things are of enormous practical value. And when we think of philosophy, we say, oh, this is all abstract stuff. It has no practical value. But Aristotle thought the other way around. Practical sciences, including ethics, uh, included ethics and politics. These were things that you could directly apply. Today, when you say, Abu Jan, I want to be a political science major. Your Abu Jan often says, "Beta, fir nokri kaun si milegi aapko? Koi engineer bano, koi doctor bano. Ye practical cheese hain. Us zamane mein ulat hisab tha. Us zamane mein ye tha ki agar wo kehta tha, Abu Jan, maine doctor banna hai, maine physics padni hai, maine chemistry padni hai. To us zamane mein log kehte the, "Beta, iska kya fayda hai? Nokri kaun dega aapko? Koi achhi cheese padho, koi ethics padho, koi politics padho. Fir aapko koi kaam milega." And last, he talked about the productive sciences. These were the polytechnics, how to build ships, how to crop plants, and so on and so forth. So the poly, even today, you know, we have um, in, in education, we have what are called polytech, uh, polytechnical institutions that teach skills and crafts. You, of course, don't learn skills and crafts as such, except for when you do extracurricular activities. You don't learn how to change a light bulb. You don't know how to build a light bulb. You learn the theoretical side of how electricity, when it passes through resistance, uh, creates uh, heat, which leads to light. You study that theoretically, but you don't ever study how to build a light bulb. Well, if you were studying how to build a light bulb, that would be polytechnical education. So what was included in the theoretical sciences? Physics, generation and corruption, on the heavens, astronomy, metaphysics, on the soul, brief natural treaties, history of animals, parts of animals, movement of animals, meteorology, progression of animals, generation of animals. So you can see that there's basically biology in here, there's physics in here, there's chemistry in here, and there's astronomy in here. What was in the practical sciences? The Nicomachean ethics. Nicomachean uh, is uh, basically, uh, that's his son's name. Uh, Eudemian eth uh, ethics, the Magna Morelia, that's the great ethics and politics. So practical sciences include ethics and politics. And productive sciences included shipbuilding, agriculture, medicine, rhetoric, arts, art of music, theater, dance, rhetoric, and poetics. Uh, and in fact, Aristotle and Plato and many others thought very highly of music, theater, dance, poetry, uh, uh, and uh, rhetoric means the ability to speak, uh, etc., to debate, etc., thought very highly of these things because they felt that these were the things that laid, that communicated ideas into the masses of people. Yes. Sorry? What about it? Did they study religion? You see, all these major philosophers belong to a tradition that, that separated itself from, the, uh, from Greek religion at the time. So Greek religion at the time believed in uh, uh, Greek, what we call it Greek mythology today. But they believed that uh, there was, uh, I mean, there was a mountain called Mount Olympus, and they believed that there were 12 gods that resided on those mountains, Zeus and Apollo and so on and so forth, uh, Venus and uh, etc. Et You've heard of those 12 gods. And, uh, <coughs> um, and th that, uh, you know, if you, if you had the favor of these gods, then these gods would be kind to you. And if you didn't have the favor of these gods, then these gods would not be kind to you. So much before Plato or uh, uh, Aristotle, 
there were a group of philosophers called the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, that began to challenge these ideas and began to say that, um, for example, uh, Xenophon said things like, well, if, um, if cows could think and talk, they would have created uh, gods in the image of cows. And if horses could think and talk, they would have created gods in the image of horses. Their gods would have looked like horses. And we have pretty much done the same thing. Um, so right then and there, with the pre-Socratic philosophers, there was a break, a break from ancient Greek religion. And all the pre-Socratic philosophers believed that in order to understand the world, you had to understand the logic of the world, that there were certain logical, deterministic principles that had to be grasped ab about the world and that religion did not offer us any unique insight into any of those things and that we had to um, understand what the world was made of, what the substance of the world was and how that substance worked together. So some of the great pre-Socratic philosophers include people like um, Thales who believed that the entire world, every substance in the world was made of water then there came uh, uh, Anax uh, Anaximander, who believed that it was made of another substance that he called Aperon. Then there was Anaximenes, who believed that the entire substance, every, that everything was made of air. Then came Heraclitus, who believed that everything was made of fire. Then came, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, slipped my mind. Uh, but then all of these ideas were combined together, and they believed that. Uh, that every substance was made of four elements, earth, water. Uh, you might have heard of the band as well, earth, air, fire, water. So they, for, uh, for 2,000 years, they believed that there were more than that. They believed that there were only four elements that made up the entire world. Then along came uh, a great, uh, uh, you know, then, then came the theory that uh, these four elements were reproduced in the human body as four humors. That was blood, yellow bile, black bile, and um, uh, what was it, one other thing, etc. And for, again, for more than 2,000 years, all medicine was based on that, on the principle of the four humors and imbalance between the humors was considered to be the reason why people felt sick, which is why the ancient Greeks and then the, the medieval Muslims and Christians practiced cupping, which was, or bleeding, which was that you bled one part of the humor, either you ble bled the, the blood or you bled the, the yellow bile, the phlegm, or you bled, uh, you know, the black bile, or you bled one of these humors in order to to create, recreate the balance, etc. People even still practice cupping because they believe it is Islamic. In fact, it is pre-Islamic. It belongs to the Greeks and is it is based on um, uh, the 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 ancient view that uh, there are four humors in the body and that the imbalance between the humors is what causes. Um, uh, illness. So the person who, uh, have you heard of the Hippocratic Oath that doctors often take, do no harm, etc. So the purpose who, the person who came up with the theory of humors is, uh, is who, after whom this oath is based. He, he was the person who had this idea. So to answer your question, these, uh, the, those who identified with philosophy had already broken with uh, Greek religion. And if you recall from my previous lecture, one of the reasons why, Aris, uh, why Socrates was given the hemlock to drink was that he was considered uh, as someone who was committing blasphemy against Greek religion. He was corrupting the youth uh, and by challenging uh, the beliefs of the Greeks. So philosophers were scientists or uh, you know, people who believed in logic rather than people who believed in revelation. Uh, at least they did not believe in the Greek revelations. Uh, or, or the writings of um, uh, well the, the 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 ancient Greek religious uh, writings uh, like Homer and Hesiod etc. They did not accept those as being um, uh, you know sort of uh, informative of what the world really was all about. At one point, I think it was Plato or somebody who even remarked that Homer should be beaten etc. Because he is talking nonsense. So does that, I hope that answers your question. But they did have. I, they, they, their ideas, they did talk about religion though. It's not the case that they didn't talk about uh, creation or how the world was created. And so they did take up some of the, the central themes of religion. What is the good life? What is morality? 
What does it mean to be good? What does it mean? How was the world created? Who created it? Where did it come from? How was matter created? Was it even created? They took up all these themes, right? These can be considered religious themes. But the answers they came up with were radically different from the answers of Greek religion. So, coming, let's go back all the way to Plato. You might recall one of the central problems that Plato tries to address is called the problem of universals. And there are two major thinkers that precede Plato who talk about the problem of universals. What is the problem? The problem is that we see lots and lots of different things. We see lots and lots of different concrete objects from which we draw a conclusion that those different categories of concrete objects share certain qualities and on the basis of those shared qualities we categorize them into one large category. Um, but all those things have different properties, also have different properties. So how do we do this? And also this, uh, this problem is confounded by the problem brought up by Heraclitus which is that each of those things is constantly in movement and constantly in flux. So if there is constant change, if there is constant flux, if there is constant movement, if, what is your name? If Amna at time when I asked her this question was a different Amna from now, which is a different Amna from now, which is a different Amna from now, then how do we know who or what Amna really is? She's constantly changing. And then there was Parmenides who believed that change is an illusion. Um, he believed that change required us, uh, change logically required that that which was nothing turns into that which is something and that which is something turns into that which is nothing. Uh, but the only thing that we can say about nothing is that, 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 is that nothing cannot exist. And if nothing cannot exist, then that which is something cannot change into that which is nothing because nothing simply does not exist. And hence change is impossible. But if change is impossible, then the question arises, how do we explain what we see in the material world, where we do see a world that is full of transformation and change, life and death. We do see it through our sense perception. We do perceive change. So then how is change, how is the perception of change to be explained? So this was the big problem. Plato solved it by basically suggesting that there are two worlds, the ideal world, in which there is no change, things are timeless, things are perfect, that would be a Parmenidian reality and the Heraclitean world which is the material world which was founded on the basis of these ideal types a triangle in the real world can you do a little experiment for me can you make a perfect circle on your on your copies make a perfect circle try and make a perfect circle is there anyone in this room who can raise their hand and say I have made a perfect perfect circle Look at the circle that you've made. Is it slightly imperfect? Yes? Okay, there is no artist in the world that can make a perfect circle. In fact, did you know that one of the first things they do when you get recruited into art school, into college, etc., is that they make you make a perfect circle. Let's see how close you can get. But nobody can make it. Can a computer make a perfect circle? <laughs> really? Have you ever seen a perfect circle on a screen? Is it perfect? If I magnify the line that the computer draws, is it a perfect circle? Huh? No? It's not a perfect circle. Sooner or later when I magnify it, you'll start seeing the pixels. You'll start seeing it's not a perfect circle. Um, can you make a perfect line? Nobody can make a perfect line. You know why? Because a line technically would not have any width. It could not have any width. It would be so slim. It should be, should be so slim because it's a line, it's not a plane, correct? Anytime you have any width, those are two dimensions. So nobody can make a perfect line even. And you can't really even make a straight line. But does that mean that the concept of a perfect circle does not exist? What's the concept of a perfect circle? Anyone? Where all points are equidistant from one point, one center, correct? That's the definition. And that's easy to understand. It's not hard. What's the definition of a line? The shortest distance between two points. Correct? And yet, there is no such thing as a line anywhere in the world. Because anytime you draw something, or anytime you create something, it's going to have a width. And anything with any width is going to be 
not a line but a plane a plane by definition is something that has a width as well as a length correct so that's not a line you can't draw a line can you you can't draw make a perfect plane you can't make a perfect circle you can't make a perfect triangle try and make a perfect triangle can you make it no you can't you can't even make it with a ruler it can't exist yet we know what a perfect triangle is it's an object with you know with three lines so that's what plato is trying to get at what he's trying to explain to you is that these concepts exist exist somewhere we can't see them but our circles and lines and triangles and squares that are imperfect are based on these concepts that are abstract cannot be grasped and the concept of a triangle is not changed by time even though the actual triangle you may make with a cardboard or with a piece of paper will no longer be a triangle after a number of years is finite everything that you make in this world is finite it crumbles or gets destroyed or gets distorted but the concept of the triangle will remain the same despite the fact that real triangles real circles uh, perfect real circles do not exist it is only in the abstract ideal world that the perfect circle exists so from this plato came to the conclusion that there are ideal forms that are the basis of all the different forms that you see everywhere you look you will see geometric forms in front of you correct you will see space and time things that are occupying space they occupy time all of that is geometry uh, and in fact plato was so fond of geometry that uh, the symbol of his academy was a triangle and below the triangle was written let no man enter who does not know geometry so he thought it was it was the foundation of the study of everything so those perfect forms plato said exist in the ideal realm and in the real world we try and make things on the basis of those perfect forms but aristotle thought this was a ridiculous point of view aristotle thought that uh, plato's idea that these ideal forms existed in an ideal sphere what do we mean by an ideal sphere we don't mean that it exists in jannat but we mean it exists in thought somewhere correct it exists as a thought the thought of a triangle exists uh, but he thought this was this was couldn't be correct in fact he said that the properties that the forms have that are supposed to be eternal unchanging and transcendental are incompatible with material objects that are changing temporal and material hence the resemblance between objects and form must also be explained in terms of yet another form how do those perfect objects sorry uh, how do those perfect forms become imperfect objects there must be some other idea that explains how a perfect idea becomes an imperfect object you understand there's the idea of a perfect red ball let's say sphere let's say but all the red spheres in this world are slightly imperfect they are either not perfectly red or they are not perfectly spherical correct so how did it happen that that perfect idea when it got translated into a material object became slightly imperfect the fact that it became slightly not red but maroon or orange may, means that there's yet another object there's yet another notion idea that explains how orange got mixed up with red or yellow got mixed up with red to produce orange so we have yet a third man that is needed to explain how um, a perfect idea gets translated into an imperfect object hence the resemblance between objects and form must also be explained in terms of another form what form does an object and the form both copy to account for this similarity or dissimilarity this leads to infinite regress negating the notion that forms are few so plato had the idea that there are a few forms that can be understood together in a dialectic but now aristotle tells us that the way in which every form combines with every other form the way in which red combines with the idea of sphere needs yet another kind of idea for that combination to occur and the way in which that red sphere that becomes a real object in very slightly imperfect requires yet another idea about imperfection and so on and so forth that means that the number of ideas that we now require to explain the uh, the number of objects that we are looking at becomes enormous becomes absolutely 
you know, too great. And this is not a good, uh, this is not a good thing because this was mean that we had a limited number of things to explain and we explained them with a greater number of ideas. That's not simplifying thought, that's complicating things and making things much harder to understand. Plato's ideas also, Aristotle said, do not explain the existence of things. To explain the why, the why the world is here is after all the main problem of philosophy. And Plato's theory, Aristotle says, fails to explain why things e exist. Even admitting that, say the idea of whiteness exists, we cannot see how it produces white objects. All right, so we understand that there's the idea of whiteness. But how does the idea of whiteness become a white kurta or a white object? How does it become a white wall? Plato has no explanation. How does the idea transform from an idea, merely an idea, into an object? Who does that? How does that happen? What is the explanation? Plato has no explanation. Plato does not explain the relation of th ideas to things. Things we are told are, are copies of ideas and participate in them. What do we mean when we say participate in them? We mean that things participate in ideas in the sense that the table, within the table, is the idea of a table and the, this, this actual table participates in the ideal table, the ideal idea of a table. But how do we understand this participation, asks Aristotle. In using such phrases, Plato is giving no real account of the relationship, but is merely uttering, uttering poetic metaphors. This is nonsense to say that the table participates in the idea of a table. How does that occur. Not only does Plato fail to explain how the idea becomes transformed into the table, he also fails to explain how the table participates in the idea. Motion is not explained. If ideas are immutable and motionless, if the idea of a circle is always the way it was and there's no change in it, so will be the world which is that copy. Agar in the ideal world there is, there is no motion and there is no change, how did change come about in the real world? But the world is a world of change, motion, life, becoming. Plato makes no attempt to explain the unceasing becoming of things, even if the idea of whiteness explains white objects. Yet, why do these objects arise, develop, decay, and cease to exist? Why do white things cease to be white, for example? To explain this, there must be some principle of motion in the ideas themselves. But there is not, according to Plato, because ideas, the ideal forms on which Plato says the world is based, are timeless, immutable. They don't change. They are immovable and lifeless, but the world is full of life. So how did lifeless ideas give rise to life, which is full of change, motion, development? Multitude of things. The world consists of a multitude of things, and it is the business of philosophy to explain why they exist. By way of explanation, Plato merely assumes the existence of another multitude of things, the ideas. टेबल को एक्सप्लेन करना था टेबल क्या होती है उसने एक आइडिया ऑफ टेबल बना दी अब हमें दो दुगनी चीजें एक्सप्लेन करनी पड़ेंगी नॉट ओनली डू वी हैव टू एक्सप्लेन द टेबल नाउ वी हैव टू एक्सप्लेन द आइडिया ऑफ द टेबल एंड वी हैव टू एक्सप्लेन हाउ द आइडिया ऑफ द टेबल बिकम्स अ टेबल एंड हाउ द टेबल पार्टिसिपेट्स इन द आइडिया ऑफ द टेबल ओह माय गॉड दिस इज गेटिंग क्रेजी बट द ओनली इफेक्ट ऑफ दिस इज टू डबल द नंबर ऑफ थिंग्स टू बी एक्सप्लेन हाउ डज इट हेल्प फास्ट टू डुप्लीकेट एवरीथिंग प्लेटो इज लाइक अ मैन हु बीइंग अनएबल टू काउंट विद अ स्मॉल नंबर फैंसीज दैट इफ ही डबल्स द नंबर ही विल फाइंड इट इजीयर टू काउंट Ideas are sensuous, says Plato. Plato thought that a non-sensuous principle must be sought in order to explain the world of sense. Sense means something I can touch, something I can feel. So uh, he has to explain all the things that we can touch and feel and see and smell and taste. But not being able to find any such principle, he merely took the objects of sense over again and called them non-sensuous. There is no difference between the horse and the idea of the horse except the useless and meaningless phrase in itself or in general attached to each object of sense to make it appear something different. What is the difference between a horse and the idea of a horse? Says, asks Aristotle. Ideas are nothing but hypothesized things of sense no different from the anthropomorphic gods of popular religion. Just as we have taken, uh, what is, here is an answer to your question. Uh, in religion, all we have done is we have taken uh, things that we had to explain, like why does the rain occur? Why does uh, uh, why are there earthquakes? Why does the sea become you know uh, have uh, have storms, etc.? And what did we do? We assumed that rain is a person, and um, 
uh, and uh, the person is angry with us and hence it rained. We assume that the sea is a person. The, you know, we called it a god because it wasn't like a person like us. We couldn't see it, we couldn't feel it, but we just anthropomorphized it. What does anthropomorph mean? Anthro means man. Morph means form of man. To take, to Morpheus means to change form. Anthropomorph means to take the form of man. So we assumed that there is a god called sea and we called it Neptune. We assumed that there is a god of rain and we called it Indra. We assumed that there is a god of air and fire and all of these things. And we just assumed that they are like human beings. So we be anthropomorphized nature. That's all we've done. And in much the same way, Plato has basically taken, made this ridiculous idea. He's taken, he said, here's a horse. Then there's the idea of the horse, and the idea of the horse participates in the horse, and so on and so forth. He's just deified the idea of the horse uh, as existing somewhere in time immemorial like a god. But in fact, this is all nonsense. There is no distinction between a horse and the idea of a horse. Uh, just as gods are nothing but deified men, so ideas are nothing but externalized things of nature. Things are said to be copies of ideas, but in fact, ideas are only copies of things. So now you see that he's going to turn Plato on his head. Instead of saying that things are based on ideas, he's saying things, we are abstracting from things, ideas. The third man argument, where there, wherever there is a common element, there must be an idea. There is a common element in all men, therefore there is an idea of men. That's Plato's argument. But there is also an element common to the individual man and to the idea of man. There must therefore be a further idea, the third man, to explain this. And between this further idea and the, and the individual man, there must be yet another idea to explain that they have in common and so on ad infinitum. In other words, yes, we have many men. They have something in common. From that common I thing, we, call, we create the idea of a man. But now we say that this idea of the man exists in some ideal realm, etc. The individual man, though, is distinct from the, from the ideal man. Otherwise, no, all the men in this room cannot be distinct from each other. The distinction between the ideal form of a man and all the actually existing men must itself have an explanation, an idea that distinguishes real men or re a real man from the, uh, from the generic idea of man. And therefore, you get all these other sort of objects that you now, thought obje objects that you have to explain. It gets ridiculous. Finally, Aristotle says, the essence of things, what makes a man a man, what makes a woman a woman, what makes a horse a horse, what makes a cat a cat, what makes a tree a tree, that essential idea, what is the essence of a cat, a cat has to have certain features. If you take away the features of a given cat, after a little while, you're going to say, that's not a cat anymore, correct? Just as if you take away, you have a white wall and you start making it less white, after a certain while, you're going to say, that's not really white anymore. Or you start taking away certain bricks, you're going to say, that's not really a wall anymore. That's just a pile of bricks. So in the same way, what are the essential items? Um, uh, these, uh, the, the essence of being a man, being a woman, being a horse, cat, whatever, which is what we're trying to understand. How do we, how do we categorize these things on the basis of their essence? Aristotle now says, is within that particular object that we're studying, not outside of it, not in some transcendental ideal realm. Ideas are the essence of things, and yet these essences are outside the things themselves. The essence of the thing must be in the thing, not outside of the thing. The essence of a triangle is in the triangle, not outside existing outside the triangle. The idea as the universal can only exist in the particular. So the universal idea of a woman exists within individual particular women or men or horses or cats or whatever. The universal horse is not something that exists by itself and independently of individual horses. Individual horses contain properties that make them horses. Those properties don't exist anywhere outside of those horses. Plato was, ha, was led into the absurdity of talking as if, besides the individual horse we know, there is somewhere another individual called the horse in general, or as if bodies, white objects, there is th a thing called whiteness. Can whiteness exist outside of a white object? I'm not talking about the concept. Have you ever seen something that is white, 
which is nothing but white. Can you even imagine it? You get the question? Can you imagine something? Can you imagine whiteness? Close your eyes, imagine whiteness. What did you imagine? No, you didn't. You imagined a plane. You imagined a plane that was white. Did you not? Yeah, you have to imagine a plane. Because you cannot imagine whiteness outside of a something. What did you imagine then? Yes. You imagined? <laughs> All right, that is a unique tangent. We have to admit the guy is super creative. Okay. I hope that, um, you know, you find uh, eternal love, uh, you know, uh, with your crush or whatever, and it does not crush you. You know why they call a crush a crush, by the way? They call a crush a crush because a crush is going to crush you. That's right. So watch out. Anyway, after that comic relief, back to the issue at hand. You cannot imagine something that is white without imagining the something that is white. You cannot imagine whiteness without looking you know, at something. Mostly it's a plane. Um, you cannot imagine the form of a horse without, for example, thinking of a particular horse. Can you imagine horsiness? You can't. Can you imagine womanness? Think of womanness. You can't. You can imagine a woman and you can think in your, you know, uh, love for that particular woman that she represents all that it means to be a woman or a man, depending on your sexual orientation. Um, but you can never imagine manliness on its own. Whenever you think of manliness, you think of a man that you think is very manly. He's probably holding a sword, he's half naked, he's got muscles all over his body, looks like a Greek god or something, and you're like, that's manliness. But you're imagining a man with specific features. You cannot imagine a man without features, can you? You'd have to, you, you can make a stick object, but that's not a man, that's a stick object, right? When we go to the bathroom, what do we look at? We look at this. This is the guys. And how do you make the girls' bathroom? I don't know. Like that, no, like that. Yes, like that. Is that a man? For God's sakes, that's not a man. That's just a symbol that, you know, you can't imagine a man without imagining a specific man. Can you imagine a cat without thinking of a specific kind of cat? For example, imagine a cat. What color was it? Black and white, but that's a specific kind of cat. Can you imagine a cat that does not have a specific color, cattiness? You can't think it. And that proves, in fact, Aristotle says, that the ideas that are contained in these objects are ideas that we have abstracted from the objects themselves. The essences are within the objects. They don't exist outside of the object. Um, and this is, in fact, the supreme self-contradiction of the theory of ideas. That it begins by saying that the universal is real and the particular is unreal, but ends by degrading the universal again into a particular. This is the same thing as saying that Plato's mistake lay in first saying that existence is not reality, but then going on to imagine that the reality is an existence. He has to finally come to the real object in order to explain the ideas that exist. So now Aristotle is going to stand up Plato on his head. In fact, Aristotle says, senses do give us accurate information about reality. The idea of the horse was simply a concept that we humans had formed after seeing a certain number of horses. Right? We looked at the animals that surrounded us and we saw that this particular animal had features in common. Sometimes its color was slightly different. Sometimes it was taller and shorter. But it always had four legs. It always had a tail or, or so on or you know it had a it could run at a certain speed. It had these certain features that we began to identify. And we said, you know what? We're going to call that a horse, and we're going to call you a donkey. Uh, and we distinguish between horses and donkeys that are actually quite familiar, similar. In fact, when horses and donkeys breed together, they create what? Lum students. No, sorry. They, <laughs> <laughs> they create mules, which are very useful because they're larger than donkeys, uh, smaller than horses, and they are they are superb at carrying things, right? You couldn't have made it to the top of Mount Everest 
without mules. Uh, so, uh, by the term form ho the form of horse, Aristotle meant that which is common to all horses. Forms were in the things because they were the particular characteristics of these things. The real object and the form of the object are just as inseparable as body and soul. The idea of the horse is an abstraction from looking at horses. The idea of a man is an abstraction, a theoretical abstraction from looking at, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, human beings that exist. The idea of a woman, similarly, the two ideas are distinguished by saying a man will have X, Y, Z properties, a woman will have ABC properties. Anytime we find somebody with these properties, we're going to call them a woman. Anytime we find somebody with those properties, we're going to call them a man. Anytime we find an animal with these properties, we're going to call it a horse. Every time we find an animal with these properties, we're going to call it a cat, and so on and so forth. So the essence of an object is within that particular object. Um, senses, therefore, should be the basis of knowledge. Things that are in the human soul purely are purely reflections of natural objects. The ideas in my mind are reflections of the things that I have seen, the things that I have experienced, tasted, smelt, touched, heard, etc. Everything in your mind is formed out of the five senses of your body. That's how your mind is shaped and formed. Nature is the real world, not that transcendental world. The world of matter, that's why it's pointing downwards, is the real world. Nothing exists in consciousness that has not first been experienced by the senses. This is a fascinating idea. If I had to create uh, an alien, all the aliens that you see in all the horrible alien movies are basically nothing but distorted forms of animals that we have seen in the real world. Right? Some look like lizards. You look at Star Trek, some look like lizards, some look like foxes, some look like trees, some look like, I'm obviously referring to Guardians of the Galaxy here, you know, but all the, some look like robots, blah, blah, blah. Everything is stuff that's in our experience. In fact, we cannot create anything outside of our experience. All we do is combine our experiences in new and different and novel and creative ways to come up with new ideas. Yes? No, he does not. That is a very good question. He does not create any distinction between the mind and the soul. None of the Greeks do. For the Greeks, the idea, uh, the mind and the soul is the same thing. Because if you recall, at this time, people didn't know what the brain was, how the brain functioned. In fact, the funny story is that, uh, w w w in fact, in, at this particular point in time and earlier on, everybody thought that... Uh, the thinking element, they didn't realize the thinking element is up here. They thought what allows you to think is the th this thing called the soul. And that soul is where? In your heart. Which is, I don't want to tap my mic. Which is why when I love, when you get a crush on someone, you don't, you, what you do is you have to give them your soul, your thoughts. Everything that you think you want to give them, your thoughts, you give them your soul. And how do you give them your, your soul? You give them a heart. The heart becomes the universal symbol. Hello, it's an important thing. It's very important. 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 Judging from the other day when we had the debate, you know what he's going to do? He's going to say, no. Actually, my thoughts are in my mind. So this Valentine's Day, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give my brain to somebody. <laughs> Dude, it's not going to work. <laughs> so the reason why we thought that, uh, jokes aside, uh, the reason why we give, you know, we think that the, the soul was in the heart, the heart was supposed to contain the soul, was because the, the way that people could tell whether somebody had died was they looked at whether their heart was beating. And if their heart was no longer beating, they said, ah, this person is dead. The soul has left the body. The heart has stopped beating. Now, if you actually look at a heart, good God, nobody would want to give an actual heart to someone. It's an ugly looking muscle, right? It's just a muscle. And that would not be romantic, trust me. If you actually went and bought a plastic heart and said, here's my heart, it would not be romantic at all. So anyway, to answer your question, yes. <laughs> the, 
the ancients thought that the thinking element was the soul. The soul was somewhere in the heart. Uh, and uh, that was the mind, that was the thinking, uh, you know, that was how you thought. And uh, they didn't realize till much later. They thought, some people thought that the brain was basically, a, a, what do you call it? A, uh, what's the thing that cools the uh, engine? Sorry? Yeah, the, that's the that's the liquid, but uh, the carbon. What is it, the carburetor that cools the the radiator? Thank you. So they thought that um, the mind was like a radiator. Its main function was to cool the blood, which gets hot when it circulates. It had no other function of thinking, etc. Later on, they realized that's not the case. Yes. Which statement? No, you can, but by only by contradicting it to Kant's a priori argument. Because Aristotle's point, I mean, Kant is basically saying that we have certain ideas that are a priori in our mind, for example, time and space and so on, dimensions, etc. Whereas Aristotle is saying the, the reverse. He is saying, in fact, the concept of time and space is born out of our experience with time and space. While when it's See, born, so Aristotle would say, has no concept of geographic space, until it puts its hand out there beyond the, the, the uh, mattress and falls over the mattress and bumps its head because Babu Temurehman forgot to put the cushion next to the baby and the baby fell off. <laughs> yeah, it happened. Okay, if you must know. But there was a carpet underneath. It happened with Zara. If she blames me in future life. I didn't get my PhD scholarship because daddy dropped me. It may or may not be true. The point is, that for Aristotle, the child, the mind, discovers the idea of space and time by experiencing it, it's not born with it. Yes. Aristotle says that we, what we have, what everything is composed of is a substance. Something is there which makes everything, which makes all the things that are there. And those substances are combined and recombined in different ways. Um, and the way in which they are combined gives that substance a particular form and it is on the basis of that form then that we determine whether that thing is in category A or category B. Substance therefore contains the potentiality to realize excuse me, a specific form just as a stone contains the capacity to become a statue of a woman or the statue of a man. It contains only the potentiality. When, when it is formed in a particular way, it becomes that thing. Every change in nature is a transformation of substance from potential into the actual. So you have wood, it can potentially become a table, and the process by which wood becomes a table is really how something from potentiality becomes actuality. And that is how you can understand and explain all the changes that you see in the world. So when we look at change, we can divide them into four causes. The material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. What are these four causes? Well, sorry. Oops, 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 oops. Here we go. So the material cause is the material substance from which the thing is made. The formal cause is the, like over there, you can see the bricks lying over there and the rocks over there. The formal cause is the plan that you want. Uh, you know, you can see there's a, there's a plan that's creating it. The efficient cause is basically the external person or act of nature that acts upon that material cause in a formal way to turn it into whatever it's becoming into. And the final cause is what it becomes, what it is going to, the final shape that it is going to take, a table, a castle, or whatever it may be. So that's how we, uh, uh, what do you call it, Aristotle explains how change occurs in nature as well as by man. Now Aristotle was a teleological thinker. This is a big word, teleology. What does teleology mean? It means that there is a purpose, a final cause behind everything. And if you want to understand and categorize that thing, you have to understand the final cause. The thing may not reach its final cause. Please try and understand. A thing may not reach its final cause, but it helps to know what its final cause, its final shape is going to be in order for us to categorize it. For example, when a, 
uh, when a seed, when you look at two different seeds, you might not be able to distinguish them. But you know that one is the seed of an apple tree, the other is the seed of a mango tree or whatever. But you may not, well, a seed of an apple and a mango tree look very different. But let's just, for argument's sake, assume that there are two seeds and they look largely similar. But when you plant them and they grow into their final shape, you discover that one was a very different plant and the other was a different plant, correct? Now, how do you then categorize the seed? You categorize it by the final form it takes, not by the initial form that it exists in. Maybe the seed will never become the apple tree that it was meant to become. Maybe it will never reach its final goal. But you categorize it, says Aristotle, by examining its final trajectory, not by looking at it at its initial point in time. Everything is changing, but the basic goal of everything is permanence. Since everything is trying to reach unchangeability, there must be a final goal that everything is trying to achieve. Physical objects fall to the ground. Man seeks permanence by conceiving of pure forms. The cosmos has a final cause and an ultimate good towards which everything is drawn. The final cause, therefore, is the essence of the object. Hence, essence is not in an ideal world, but within the thing itself. Everything is unfolding into its final shape. Taimur Rahman, when he was a baby, uh, was not its final shape. Taimur Rahman, when he is a full-fledged adult, with wit and body in, you know, at its peak, that would be the ultimate Taimur Rahman. <laughs> um, uh, and that would be how we would categorize those things. Teleology is not the nature of scientific reasoning today. This is not what Aristotle is saying, this is what I'm saying. Food and water are necessary conditions of life, but it is not the purpose of water or oranges to be food for us. We don't think in these terms anymore, but this was a useful way for Aristotle to think about things in order to categorize them and then to study them. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, on the one end of the spectrum, you have the final cause to which everything is moving. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the first cause from which everything begins. There could be no motion Aristotle says, unless there is an initiator of movement that is itself unmoved. Let's take for example, if this dais is to be moved, I will plant my feet and then I will move it, correct? But notice that when I move the dais, I become unmoved and the dais moves. If I move, if I exert force here and I move backwards, the dais will not move, correct? So for this thing to move, for the secondary thing to move, I have to be with greater inertia than that thing. Uh, and if you go all the way back in, 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 in the causal chain in this, you will end up with, if you want to explain the motion of the stars, the universe, everything, Aristotle says if you go back in the chain of command in this particular way, you will end up with something, with an energy, with a force, that is at the heart of all the movement. It began the movement. It was the unmoved mover, the thing that cannot be moved. It is the thing that moved all the things that are in movement. Yes. This reasoning has at least three fallacies in before you, before you Let me finish the reasoning, then come to the fallacies. Um, so Aristotle's unmoved mover is eternal, intelligent, and non-material. It's uh, this is a pure form of thinking about itself that is actuality without potentiality. It is perfection. It is Aristotle's God. But not a God that intervenes in the affairs of nature. This is a very different God from the God of theology. It's not a God that says, Tumne acha kaam kiya hai, ya bura kaam kiya hai, tumhe saza ya jaza milegi. No, it's like a physical force that is like a clock that winds up the world and then pushes it into motion, but then does not interfere with the laws of that motion in any way. Those laws are set. It does not create miracles. Those laws are set and they come into motion. Uh, this is God, but, but not a God that intervenes in the affairs of nature, which always follows their natural course. This is a God unmoved by both earthly and cosmic events. Yes. Now, Aristotle likes to put things into what he calls his logical system, which is his syllogism. Syllogism is composed of two premises and a conclusion. The major premise, the minor premise, the first premise, the second premise, and the conclusion. For example, the argument, if all A's are B's, is the first premise, and the second premise is all B's are C's, the conclusion is that all A's must be C's. If all cows are mammals, 
and all mammals are animals, then all cows are animals. That's logically true and un irrefutable. Irrefutable, says um, Aristotle. So what we've got to try and do with respect to every subject that we try and study is we've got to break down the argument into its individual premises and then examine whether those premises are true or false or whether we have derived false conclusions from true premises. If we break it down in this way, we will be able to think more clearly about our problems. The structure of the argument is true. The conclusion may be false if the premises are untrue or if we have taken out an untrue conclusion from the premises themselves. These are the laws of deductive logic. From this syllogism, which really is the expansion of uh, so the Socratic dialect, Aristotle derives three laws of logic. These are so instrumental that they have been so influential that The first is the law of identity. A is equal to A. Taimur is Taimur. Good God, that makes no sense. That's a tautology. But if you think about it, if Taimur is Taimur, then Taimur is not what is not Taimur. What does that even mean? The, that is the law of non-contradiction. A cannot be simultaneously equal and unequal to, uh, to A. A cannot be equal, uh, is unequal to not A. A is not not A. So A Temur is not what is not Temur. How, what, uh, what, is, what is he talking about? This is nonsense. Uh, what he's trying to say is that uh, it cannot simultaneously be raining and not raining outside. If it is raining, then it is not not raining. And uh, so, sorry, yes, that's correct. If it is raining, then it is not not raining. And if it's not raining, then it cannot be raining. The two contradictory ideas cannot be true at the same time. The, and also the law of the excluded middle, middle, which should not be confused with the fallacy of the excluded middle. Among two contradictory propositions, one must be true and the other false. Either A is true or not A is true. So if you say it is raining and that turns out to be not true, then it is true that it is raining. Samajai? From these, th <laughs> you will work on this because there's an entire course talked by Shabir Hussain which just sort of explains these and I don't expect to, uh, you to understand that in such a short time. But anyway, learn these law, 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 laws, laws of identity, non-contradiction and excluded middle. And you may watch my video, which is on YouTube, to understand these further, which is in Urdu. Might be simpler to understand in Urdu. So, but that doesn't mean that Aristotle was opposed to inductive logic. He also thought that from a series of particulars, we could derive a universal. Induction, however, was not demonstrative. It was secondary. Uh, you may have hundreds of white crows, and you may therefore come to the conclusion that, sorry, you may have hundreds of black crows, and you may come to the conclusion that crows are black. But if you've only come to the conclusion that crows are black by observing 100, 1,000, 1 million crows, that is not absolutely true. It is probably true. Because it would take one single white crow to disprove that, you know, maybe there's just one white crow amongst 1 million black crows. And so inductive logic can give you an idea, an approximate idea of what could be true, but it cannot give you absolute certainty. Only deductive logic can do that. Next, Aristotle, the grid categorizes, takes nature. He says, if we look at all things, we can divide them into living and non-living. Uh, those that are living can change things through their, through their own influence. They have the potentiality for self-change. Living things include plants and creatures. Amongst the creatures, we can look at animals and humans. There are no sharp boundaries, he says, between the natural world. There's a gradual transition from simple growths to more complicated plants, from simple animals to more complicated animals. Here he is really being quite, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, what's the word, um, almost uh, sort of uh, figuring out the theory of evolution uh, because things, creatures move from less complex to, to, to greater degrees of complexity. Man, he says, is a spark of divine reason. This is directly taken from Socrates. The movement of the stars and the planet guide all the movements on Earth, he thought, which of course is not true. We know that now. Uh, unless, you have a astrology of astrology. Who has a shock of astrology? Who has seen horoscope? Okay. 
go ahead do that is entertaining but it's not true okay <laughs> um, the first mover is itself addressed but it is the formal cause of the movement of the heavenly bodies and thus of all movement in nature says Aristotle now finally we come to ethics and politics which is the main subject of today's lecture um, Aristotle wants you to lead the good life he says there are three forms of happiness and they must be in balance in order for us to lead the good life students pay attention if you don't do these three things you will become depressive and sad and that will not be a good thing for you the first is a life of pleasure and enjoyment when you go out with your friends and you have pizza and you have a coca-cola and afterwards you listen to some groovy music and you crack jokes with each other and you have a good time and you don't get crushed that is a life of pleasure and enjoyment uh, and that is very necessary says Mr. Aristotle. Second is the life of a free and responsible citizen. For example, we have climate change coming about in the world. What are you going to do about it? Septe tomorrow, which is September 20th, there's going to be a protest for climate change. How many of you are going? That is wonderful. That is absolutely great. So I encourage all of you to go. I think it's 3 o'clock in the Lahore Press, uh, Press Club and show that you care about nature. That is the example of a free and responsible citizen, somebody who cares about his fellow beings. And last but not least is another kind of pleasure, the thinker and philosopher, the nerd who likes to not take breaks and pays attention to Dr. Temu Rehman in class and says, oh my God, this is just the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my life. These three different things need to be in balance. Plato would have us believe that the life of pleasure and enjoyment is a waste of time. Yeah, you can be a free and responsible statement, but that's not the goal of life. The goal of life is to be the philosopher king, is to be the guardian. The greatest goal of life is to acquire knowledge. But Aristotle says, you will be a very unhappy man if you do not have a life of pleasure and enjoyment, if you don't do things for society, and if you don't think about the bigger questions of life. All these three things have to be in balance in order for you to be a completely rounded individual. And there he comes with the idea in ethics of the golden mean, what we call Myana Ravika Rasta, the middle road. He says, we should neither be cowardly nor rash, but courageous, neither, amaz neither extravagant uh, nor, uh, amazingly is the wrong word over here, uh, neither extravagant nor uh, conjuice, uh, but we should be liberal, liberal not in the political sense, liberal in the sense of how we should spend our money. Whenever you go to one extreme or the other extreme, you end up in the wrong place. You have to stake the road of the middle in order to, be, to lead a good, healthy life. That's what he means when he says we've got to have balance as well. The middle road is the best road. Man is by nature, he says, a political animal. What does he mean? He doesn't mean that man loves talking about politics. Everybody loves talking about politics. That's not what he means. What he means is by a political animal, he means that man wants to live in the polis. What is a polis? A polis is a city that has a state. So man by nature wants to create a political state, a society that is run and governed by laws, a society that is run and governed by politics. Man desires to live with others. The highest form of human fellowship is only to be found in the state. Man achieves his potential in the city state. Without the city state, you cannot become, you cannot achieve your potential as an individual. We are collective beings. We like to live together. When we come and live together, we like to create laws that allow us to achieve our potential. There is natural law, which is a law of nature, and state, therefore, is a natural organism, and when it accords to natural law, that's when you create the best kind of state. Political obligation was based on natural law. The state itself was a natural organism, according to Aristotle. The city-state, though, Aristotle thought, must be small. There's Athens for you. If a state has too many, it becomes a nation and not a state, and is almost incapable of constitutional government, or ethical or political unity. Hence, he thought that a state must be smaller than 10,000 people. How many students are here in Lums? 4,000. Add the faculty and the staff, how many do you get? Five, 6,000 maybe. It, that's enough for a state. So Lums should, be, it has, should have its own government, according to Aristotle, wherever there's 10,000. What about Lahore as a city? Good God, it has 8 million people. According to Aristotle, it's not a state, it's a bloody nation. It's too big, 
It can't be managed. And what about Pakistan? 200 million people. Oh my God, are you kidding me? And what about China? 1.3 billion people. Aristotle would have thought that is an insane idea to have a state based on so many people. Why? Well, because in Aristotle time, Aristotle's time, there is no TV, there is no internet, there is no social media, there is no um, akhbarat and so on and so forth, radio, mass communication of any sort, number one. Number two, Aristotle thought that it was very important for the people of a state to know each other at some fundamental level. And he thought that if a state exceeded 10,000 people, there would be too many people for us to know. I mean, when you vote, do you know everybody that exists in Pakistan? And then do you decide who's the best person to, to, to lead Pakistan from all the 200 million people that live in Pakistan? Of course not. You don't know all the 200 million people that live in Pakistan. You maybe know 100, 200 major political figures. And that's it. You choose from the 100, 200 out of a population of 200 million. There could be people with such greater potential that could lead your country. But you don't know of them because the country is too large. Yes. Now, Aristotle thought on the basis of all his logical reasoning and thinking that Plato had neglected to examine the life of the majority that is the producers, that is the low class, that is, was the third class, the laborers. He disagreed entirely with the idea that the guardian class should be without property or should be without family. He said, what kind of people would these be who have no children or have ch ch their children are taken away from them? They have no wives, they have no property. The state was based on family and private property. The family was the origin of political life because it is the institution that brings people together. It socializes people and the state was based is the ultimate socialization of people. So the people who are running now that society, based on the, on the common bond between man and man, don't themselves have families. The guardian class, therefore, would be deprived of happiness. They'd be bloody unhappy because they won't have kids, they won't have wives, they won't have anything, property, etc. They won't have businesses to take care of, crafts to look at, etc. If part of the state was deprived of happiness, then the whole state could not attain to happiness. If you were run by people who only cared about books, buried their noses in books, and didn't have real, didn't have real lives, real families, didn't know what that was all about even. How could they would be bloody, depressed, unhappy people? And how could depressed and unhappy people make for a society, build a society that was happy, says Aristotle. So, Aristotle wants to look at politics in a completely different way. Instead of the way, you see, the way Plato approached politics is the way he approached everything. Plato thought that there's an essence behind everything. There's an essence of the table, the perfect table. So when he looks at politics, Plato says there is a perfect state. Correct? And so first he tries not to look at any real existing state, but he wants to just construct, like he would construct, a, what is the idea of a perfect triangle? He's trying to understand the idea of a perfect state. Doesn't matter if it's attainable or non-attainable. What is that perfect state? So he created that perfect republic, which he called, correct? And then he said, now what we've got to do with the real states that exist is try to get to that ideal form. Just as a carpenter would try to make a table in the ideal way of a table. Just as you made a circle in the ideal way that circle should be made. Uh, you, to become a great artist, you should become come as close to a perfect circle as possible. If you could draw a really perfect circle, then People would say you are a great craft. You know your your craft with the, your hands is very very good, correct? So in the same way, the purpose of politics was come to that was to come to that ideal state. Aristotle begins in an entirely different way. He says the idea of the horse comes from observing real horses. In much the same way, if I want to look at politics, I have to observe real politics and draw conclusions by looking at the actually existing states rather than constructing this ideal state and then telling everybody to try and get to that ideal state. What I've got to do is look at real states. So he sent his students out to get the constitutions of all the states that existed, the laws of all the states. He put them together in his library, and then he studied all of them. And after studying all of them, he categorized them, as he loves to do. He's the great, great categorizer and classifier. And when he categorized them, he said, well, first and foremost, we can categorize states by who rules. Do they have one ruler? Do they have a king? Do they have a few rulers, like a council? Or do they have many rulers? You know, like, a, uh, you know, they have you know, you know, something larger than a council that rules society. And then he looked at the aims and objectives of those states. Uh, you have, could have one ruler, a few rulers, many rulers. But what are the aims of that state? Is, does the state try to make its citizens happy, prosperous? 
Does it work for the betterment of its citizens? That's the question. So he, did, he, he, divided two, he made two categories. Those that work for the happiness, prosperity, well-being of the citizens and those that do not. And then he says, well, when you have one ruler, but that one ruler does work for the happiness of its citizens, we call that kingship. But when he works for his own power, uh, we call that tyranny. And when you have a few rulers, you have a council that's ruling, and the council works for the betterment of the people, we call that aristocracy. But when they work for their own benefit to gather riches, we call that oligarchy. Oligarchy means someone who is very rich, and oligarchy is someone who is rich. And when you have many rulers, the people themselves are the rulers, and they work for the betterment of all the people, then we call that a polity, but when they work for their own individual or, or, or their own betterment at the expense of the betterment of society as a whole, we call that a democracy. So clearly, he did not think of democracy in the same way that you and I think of democracy. He was not pro-democratic, he was anti-democratic. What defines a bad state uh, uh, but a good citizen? You could have a situation where, given that all things are determined by their end, Cities were bad according to the end they set themselves. If they sought the welfare of the whole, they were good. If the welfare of only a part, they were bad. If the object of the state was bad, then, is, then the citizen who fulfills that object was a bad man, but a good citizen. If you obey the laws of a bad state, you are a good citizen. If you were in Nazi Germany and you did what the government asked you, you were a good citizen. But were you a good person? Aristotle says, no, you were not a good person. The good state would protect property property and more importantly would present the positive good in order to bring its citizens to the best life. That's what a good state aspires to. One of the states that I talked about, uh, whether you rule by one person, you rule by a council or you're ruled by the many, can be a good state potentially. Um, now the greatest thing about Aristotle is he's writing 2000 years ago but he understands politics as being the product of class struggle. How do these different states, how are these different states formed? How do you get democracy and how do you get, uh, you know, timocracy and tyranny and all of the kingship and so on and so forth? He says, this is, this is all the consequence of class struggle, except he calls classes, he uses a different word for it, he calls them factions. What does he call them? Factions. But today, you know, in social science, we would call them classes. Cla clash of factions these factions represent class entrance. Athens, for example, Athens versus Sparta, democracy versus aristocracy. Aristotle gave to the world definitions of political terms which it has, yet not, it has not yet had to supersede. The opposition to democracy is the result of a revolution against plutocracy, says Aristotle. Democracy is when the poor and not the men of property are the rulers. What a fantastic definition of democracy. जिनके पास मलकियत नहीं है जो जमींदार नहीं है जब वो इकतदार संभाल लेते हैं उसको हम जमहूरियत कहते हैं डजेंट मैटर इफ दिस इलेक्शंस और नो इलेक्शंस द क्लास व्हिच रूल्स डिटरमिन्स द फॉर्म ऑफ द स्टेट डेमोक्रेसी एग्जिस्ट्स व्हेन द प्रॉपर्टीलेस पीपल क्लास बिकम्स द डोमिनेंट क्लास इज व्हाट एरिस्टोटल इज एक्सप्लेनिंग इन अ डेमोक्रेसी द पुअर विल हैव मोर पावर देन द रिच बिकॉज़ देयर आर मोर ऑफ देम एंड द विल ऑफ द मेजॉरिटी इज सुप्रीम so you see here that his con concept of democracy flows not out of a procedure, i.e. elections are not democracy, elections are not democracy, nahi, but out of an understanding of which class controls the political process. When the class of oligarchs, for example, controls the process, he says that's an oligarchy. When the king controls the process, he calls that a kingship or tyranny, depending on whether it's a good or a bad king, and so on. So the, what class controls the political process? Democracy, he says, is inferior to aristocracy because it is based on the false assumption of equality. It is based on the assumption that your opinion is as good as my opinion, right? Whereas I am a PhD in political science and you are an undergraduate student. So is your opinion equal to my opinion? In democracy, yes, one man, one vote. But for Aristotle, as a philosopher, he does not think that the opinion of an uneducated person is equal to the opinion of an educated person. The problem arises from the idea that those who are equal under the law are equal in all other respects. They are not equal in all other respects. Some people understand politics better, others do not. 
Because people are so easily misled and so fickle, changeable in their views, the ballot should be limited, he says, only to the intelligent, to the well, to the aware. He was opposed to, and you have heard this argument millions of times. Iqbal has also talked about this argument, although then he also has shares that contradict himself and talk about democracy. But you've heard this argument a million times. Pakistan is not ready for democracy because people of Pakistan are uneducated. Who is going to educate them? The government. When is the government going to educate them? Never. Because the educated people are in power and they want to remain in power. And as soon as they educate the uneducated, they will lose their power. So therefore, we will stay with the status quo forever and ever. So anyway, Aristotle was opposed to open elections as this would make government subservient to ignorant mass of citizens. He advocated the selection of magistrates by lot from amongst the recognized aristocracy. He hoped to eradicate revolution. He didn't like the idea that the poor should overthrow government. He says the way to prevent a revolution is, is by distributing authority through the different sections of the state to check unrest and revolution. Give every class a little bit of power then you will have a stable society, he says. The, there should be written laws that guarantee against the instability of men who could be swayed by passion. In other words, he was an advocate of the rule of law. Kanun likh lo. Jab ek dawai likh liya, to phir us jo likha wa kanun hai, uske khilaaf koi banda judgment nahi pass kar sakta. A mixed form of government he advocated with power between factions to prevent a revolution. The distribution of goods should be made to the whole community. In other words, a sort of welfare state. You know, everybody should have a little bit of, nobody should be dirt poor, he says. He condemned interest, uh, in, uh, usury, which is basically uh, giving people money and then taking interest rates from them, what we call the foundation of modern banking. And last but not least, he thought that friendship was the ultimate check to treachery. अगर आप दोस्ती यारी बढ़ाएंगे भाईचारा बढ़ाएंगे पाकिस्तान में या ट्विटर पे तो शायद फिर आपको गद्दार कम मिले फ्रेंडशिप इज द ग्रेटेस्ट गुड व्हिच कैन हैपन टू एनी सिटी एज नथिंग सो मच प्रिवेंट्स सेडिशन नथिंग सो मच प्रिवेंट्स सेडिशन एज कमिंग टुगेदर फाइनली यस आई नो बिग ऑन बाय द मैन द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट सब्जेक्ट ऑफ ऑल कम्स अप व्हिच इज वुमन व्हाट वाज हिज व्यूज ऑन वुमेन ही थॉट वुमेन आर अनफिनिश्ड मेन यू कुड हैव बीन मेन were you just so lucky, but you weren't. Um, and, and unfortunately, his views, which are, as you can see, much more anti-women, were much more influential in the medieval period than Plato's views that were, in fact, much more pro-women than Aristotle's. Woman is an unfinished man, left standing on a lower step in the scale of development. In other words, you know, there was this development scale, both, you know, we were going together, and then suddenly you stopped, and we continued. Man provides the form, and woman contributes the substance. He meant that quite literally in the sense of uh, the seed and the egg that creates the baby. He thought that woman only provides the substance, but the content of that person was only provided by the man. That's an incorrect genetic theory today, as we know. Of course, he didn't understand genetics, but they did understand how reproduction, of course, occurred. Man was the sower, the woman, the soil. Children inherit only, therefore, male characteristics. So his biology was all wrong. He thought that when, uh, uh, when, when, these, when things mate, the female species in all animals only provides the substance. That, of course, cannot be denied because the child comes out of the woman, but the man provides the form. So you see how he is relating that to his metaphysics, metaphysics etc. Uh, so his idea of procreation was an active, ensouling, masculine element bringing life to a passive female element. How can I help you, says the woman. Uh, sorry, where was I? Right. And then he says, woman is more mischievous, less simple, more impulsive, more compassionate, more easily moved to tears, more jealous, more quarrelous, more apt to scold and to strike, more prone to despondency and less hopeful, more void of shame or self-respect, more false of speech shoot, more, more deceptive, of more, uh, more retentive, retentive of memory. You'll find out when you're in a relationship that, you know, you'll say, in uh, three years ago, when we went to this movie, you did not buy me popcorn, etc. Also, more wakeful, more aware, more shrinking, and more difficult to rouse to action, risk averse. Do you think that's true? 
No? They're not more mischievous? Look. You are a... Kya naam hai aapka? Asif. Hey? Asif. Asif. Asif, you think you're a clever guy, but you're just a simple guy who likes to play his uh, computer games and likes to shoot the stuff with his friends. You have no idea. You are a simpleton. Women are more impulsive. Well, what's wrong with being impulsive, I ask you? Impulsive can be a good thing. More compassionate. Certainly nothing wrong with being more compassionate, more caring. More easily moved to tears. Well, if you're more compassionate, then you're going to be more easily moved to tears. I, by the way, when I watch, I love watching chick flicks. Anybody who likes watching rom-coms? Okay, I, I, you know, it's crazy. I, I love playing football. I like, you know, I enjoy breaking my bones once in a while, etc. I'm what you can call a guy who likes to be macho, etc. But I also like chick flicks. And when I watch chick flicks and the girl finally gets the guy or the guy finally gets the girl, I start weeping. It's true, I can't help myself. The male, and if you'd had any doubts about that, here are more quotations. The male is by nature superior and the female inferior. The one rules and the other is ruled. So, very clear. Woman is to man, and if that wasn't clear, as the slave is to the master, oh good God, the manual to the mental worker, the barbarian to the Greek. Woman is weak of will and therefore incapable of independence of character or position. She can't even take an independent position. The courage of a man is seen in commanding and that of a woman in obeying. Farad Hashmi would love him. State should determine the minimum and maximum age of marriage for each sex the best season for conception and rate of population increase. Women should be confined to female quarters. A woman's personal becomes her husband's. But also, a society cannot be happy unless women are happy too. So basically, you have to be my slave. You have to be to me like a Roman, uh, like a barbarian is to a Greek. You have to obey me. I have to command, all of these things. And in addition to that, you gotta be happy too. You gotta have a smiling face every time I come home. And if that wasn't bad enough, Aristotle had similar views about slavery. He called them a tool with a voice. Men by nature were divided into two groups. Those who were rulers by nature and those who submitted by nature. Could not explain, but this could obviously not explain why amongst the tribes that they took as slaves, they were also leaders. He excluded slaves from his entire political framework. He only meant it for Greeks. Slaves as, property, slaves as property were necessary for the maintenance of a family, said Aristotle. The family was the essential unit of the state, so private property became indirectly necessary to the state. Protection of property was important to the state, not necessarily paramount, but was important. So you see that in both the case of women as well as slaves, his point of view was regressive not just for the times today, but even for his own times. And I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt in this regard. It's very difficult to do so. I tried my best, but it's very difficult. I only tried my, my, my best because every time I teach somebody, I try to take his side. Uh, so when I teach Plato, you must have noticed, I try to put Plato's best foot forward. And when I teach Aristotle, I try to put his best foot forward. But in this case, that's not possible. In the case of women and slaves, Aristotle is a reactionary of his period. But I think um, his influence nonetheless is massive. Not only is he the main scientist that everybody refers to till the time of Newton, Aristotle, the whole period till Newton comes about is considered the period of the domination of Aristotle over science. But he's also had a huge influence on Muslims and specifically Arabs, much greater than the influence of Plato. In fact, when Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina and others, uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, Ibn Rushd, all of these people, they didn't really read Plato, they read Aristotle. And Aristotle's views on women have had a huge influence both on Christianity as well as on Islam, uh, on Islamic culture and Christian culture, both of which shared Aristotle's views about the inferiority of women. Nonetheless, having said that, his views on the basis of knowledge, his criticism of Plato, the idea that our knowledge is acquired from our senses, the idea 
that, uh, that the essence of an object cannot be separated from the object, but is merely a theoretical abstraction made in the minds of men, I think is an idea not just worth pondering over, but an, is an idea that has also led to significant advances in the way that we conceive of the world and the way that we have thought of the, the natural and human world and the advances that we have made in scientific reasoning. Does that mean that scientific reasoning is contaminated by patriarchy? That remains an open question. Thank you all.